um, Ms. Bibbs uh, Goodman, just to acknowledge your, your presence in the meeting. Uh, it's, her address is on the invite, but it's dbibbs at dch.georgia.gov. That's dbibbs at dch.georgia.gov. So just a roll call of the uh, MAC members. Uh, Fran Baker Witt. Dr. Gondola Polly, excuse the pronunciation, I apologize. No worries, Dr. Gondola Polly, yes. Th thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura Colbert. Here. Morning. Uh, Dr. Alexander. Here. Good morning, Dr. Vaughn. We saw Dr. Seth, our chair. Uh, Dr. Jaggers. Dr. Singleton. Dr. Sukas. Present. Dr. Davis. Absolutely here. And uh, Victoria Walter. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, oh. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Seth, I turn the meeting over to you, ma'am. Great. Thank you, Dr. Holloway. Um, good morning and um, hello on this brisk fall morning. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. We first need to have a motion to adopt the agenda. Motion to adopt the agenda. Second. Second, Alexander. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 And any opposed? Great. Agenda has been adopted. Next uh, order of business is to approve the minutes that Ms. Bibbs had sent out to all of us from last meeting. Um, do I? Can I get a motion and a second? for the approval of the minutes. A motion to approve, Dr. Davis. Second, Alexander. Thank you. All in favor, um, say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Excellent. The minutes from last meeting have been approved. So we'll get started with um, the next order of business, which uh, we're looking forward to hearing from the executive director uh, Ms. Lynette Rhodes about the medical assistance plan report. Hi, good morning. Can you all hear me? Absolutely. Good morning. Good morning. And we can see you too. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I like Teams. It, it, it works well. So um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this morning. I've got a few updates to share um, with the committee. I'll start out by talking about the public health emergency. Um, and I'll title this phase navigating <laughs> the public health emergency, which I think is what we're uh, all trying to do at this point. Um, so from the DCH perspective, um, our teams, our staff uh, has been working re remotely since March. And so we continue to do that. Uh, most likely that will continue uh, through the first of 2021 um, until we you know, hear otherwise. As I'm sure you are all aware, the public health emergency has been extended uh, through the end of January. Uh, so all of the waivers and concessions that we put in place will remain in place until the end of the public health emergency. We are having weekly calls with CMS. These are all state calls um, where all of the uh, Medicaid directors from each state are participating. And um, they're very informative calls and the purpose is really to um, give updates you know, nationwide on what's happening and what the concerns are. Uh, and so just wanna talk about, about a couple of those. Um, the first thing that has been a big area of concern is the decline in well child visits uh, and immunizations. And so the concern there is that for our Medicaid and CHIP population, and these are individuals under, these are individuals under the age of 21, these are our minors, 
Um, CMS, you know, they receive information nationwide from all of the Medicaid agencies. And so they did an analysis and basically pointed out to us that across the board nationwide, there has been a significant decline in the number of children that are going in for well child visits. Um, there's a significant decline in the number of immunizations and vaccines. Uh, and so CMS has encouraged the states again nationwide to reach out to providers and members to encourage them to you know, go back in to see their physicians um, and to make sure that they're following up with the required uh, you know, schedules and appointments. And so I shared this information with our commissioner. And so we have put in place uh, an approach that we're going to be taking. We're going to do a public service announcement, and this is going to be a joint effort between the Department of Community Health and the Department of Public Health. Um, so we are now uh, preparing and drafting uh, talking points for both commissioners. Uh, and we're preparing to move forward with that uh, public service announcement in the upcoming weeks. Additionally, we have spoken with our care management organizations about the concerns raised uh, by CMS and have encouraged them to partner with some of our provider associations uh, to basically get the word out and to do outreach and encourage again uh, our members and providers to follow up on these appointments. And so we have looped in the Georgia Academy of Pediatrics as well as the Academy of Family Physicians to help um, with that work. So our CMOs will be partnering with those two associations, again, just to try to do uh, more targeted and intentional outreach. Uh, so that is definitely one area of concern that we have, have honed in on. Uh, so for the committee, to the extent that you all can help um, with this effort, by all means, we welcome um, your assistance uh, and your participation. And if you have any recommendations or suggestions, we would love to hear those. Um, the next thing that CMS has spent quite a bit of time focusing on is the Provider Relief Fund. Um, so as you are aware, um, CMS had issued per the CARES Act funding to those providers who had significant losses due to COVID-19. Uh, and so providers were required to apply and submit their applications through the CMS portal. There were three phases of the Provider Relief Fund. Uh, the last phase ended on November the 6th. As of today, we have not uh, been made aware of a fourth phase. So um, I am hopeful that all of those who are interested in applying have in fact applied. Um, I think once this distribution is made, then we'll have a better idea of the number of providers within Georgia who actually benefited from uh, the Provider Relief Fund. So at our next quarterly meeting, um, we should be able to share with you some statistics uh, regarding the Provider Relief Fund. Um, in some of our previous meetings, we did talk about all of the waivers that we had put in place. Uh, so I do just want to mention that all of those remain in place today. Um, we have not made any changes with respect to those, uh, so those are all still in place today. And these were the waivers that were associated with things such as uh, co-payments, premium payments for our Peach Care for Kids members, uh, provider enrollment changes, uh, and those types of changes. They again all remain um, in place. We continue to maintain enrollment for all Medicaid and CHIP members. So we are not terminating and have not terminated any Medicaid or Peach Care for Kids members since the onset of the public health emergency. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone that those members continue to be enrolled today. At the conclusion of the public health emergency, at that time, we will then go back in and begin conducting 
um, the redeterminations to determine which of those members should be terminated and which of those members should remain enrolled. And, you know, there that, that is a, a, a very important topic of discussion. Um, there, as you can imagine, is a, a huge amount of concern um, regarding that process and what it is going to look like. Um, so we are waiting on guidance from CMS in terms of the timeline. Uh, how much time will we have to conduct those redeterminations? We're also waiting to hear back from CMS in terms of any type of communications. Um, so we'll keep you all posted. We'll send out messages, you know, via our banner uh, messages through GAMIS, um, just so that everyone uh, is aware of what's occurring. To give you an idea of the volume that we're talking about, um, annually, and this is just generally speaking, we conduct between 850,000 to 900,000 annual redeterminations each year. Um, that amounts to about 80,000 redeterminations per month. And so if you think that, you know, if you think of it in terms that the public health emergency has been in place since March, so each month since March, we have refrained or postponed conducting any type of redeterminations. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the volume um, that we are looking at. And absolutely, there will be some members um, that will be terminated once we begin doing those uh, annual determinations. So again, we're waiting from guidance. We're waiting for guidance from CMS, and that work will not begin until after the public health emergency um, has ended. The last thing I'll mention with respect to uh, the public health emergency and COVID-19 uh, is the tele telehealth. So as you all are aware, we made a significant number of changes regarding telehealth services. Um, those will remain in place. Uh, after the public health emergency, we are fully expecting to keep those changes in place. There will be some minor tweaking, um, very few changes, and these will be things um, related to HIPAA requirements and security and privacy requirements, and also just making sure that um, the services are appropriate for telehealth. Um, so we are working on that right now. We're looking at those services. Um, so we'll keep you all posted in terms of our plans moving forward, but just know that for the most part, those changes that we've put in place for telehealth will remain in place with a few minor exceptions. Um, so I think I'll pause there, Dr. Holloway, just to see um, if anyone, and Dr. Sheff, to see if anyone has any questions about uh, those updates related to the public health emergency. Um, this is Laura. Um, I guess my question for you is on the redeterminations once the public health um, emergency expires. Obviously, that's going to be a really sensitive time for consumers and making sure that, you know, Medicaid members have enough notice about, you know, the status of their coverage. Has right. CMS given any indication of, like, providing the state with any extra resources for that? I mean, it sounds like guidance is coming, but funds or other things to help support you all in that? Yeah, not as of today. <laughs> so that is that is a great question. Uh, and it is definitely one that we are very, very aware of. Um, so as of today, there have been no indications from CMS that additional funding will be provided to account for, you know, staffing and additional resources. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, but as of today, that has not been communicated to the states. Thank you. Um, this is Dr. Sheth. I just want to say um, how happy I am to hear that the telehealth will stay in place. Yeah. That has been a major plus just to improve overall health care for all of our patients, um, particularly our asthmatics during this time period. So I'm glad to hear that. And, and I'm sure the HIPAA requirements will probably be such that 
and I'm going to wait for guidance, but that not necessarily FaceTiming and things like that, that we have proper HIPAA guidance in place. Exactly. You're spot right. on. <laughs> right. So we just want to make sure that we're tightening those things up. You know, CMS relaxed a lot of those um, HIPAA and security requirements because of the public health emergency, but they have indicated to us in the all state calls that at the conclusion of the public health emergency, they will be putting those requirements in place again. Um, so we're going to have to follow suit. Good. Well, that's that's good to hear, actually. And um, with respect to the decrease in the well children um, visits, I can simply say, giving you our feedback as a pediatrician, we are seeing that and actively trying to get our patients in. But we'll look forward to working with the AAP and the CMOs about recalls and getting our patients in to get the immunization rates up. But yep, thank you. All right. Um, and then a few more updates and then I'll turn it back over um, to you. Uh, patients first act. So just wanted to give you guys an update. Um, as you know, for the past year, we've been working on an 1115 waiver uh, that would allow us to provide Medicaid coverage to an additional uh, category of members or an additional class of assistance. Um, I am pleased to report that we did receive approval from CMS. And so we are now in the implementation stages of that particular waiver. Uh, and so just as a quick refresher, the Pathways to Coverage waiver will provide coverage to individuals ages 19 to 64 uh, who are up to 100% FPL, but these individuals will have to meet certain qualifying activities. Uh, and these are things like um, employment or education, or if they are you know, disabled and require a reasonable accommodation. Um, we've got uh, processes and procedures and provisions in place for those individuals as well. Um, so we are working through implementing that right now. We're working very closely with DFACS uh, and making adjustments to the gateway and IES system. Uh, so just know that there will be more to come there. Uh, and the same thing as it applies to the 1332 waiver. Uh, so both of those have now been approved by CMS uh, within the past month. Uh, and so you're you're getting it, uh, you know, pretty new and updated information. So we'll, we'll keep you posted. Um, the next waiver that I'll mention is the 1115 waiver to extend postpartum services. Um, so we presented to the DCH board on October the 8th, our proposal to extend postpartum services for a period of six months. Today, we provide postpartum services for 60 calendar days after the delivery of the baby. So this waiver would in essence add an additional four months, thus giving a total period of six months for postpartum services. Um, we had a public comment period open for a window of 30 days that closed on November the 9th. Uh, so we did receive about 14 comments total from various associations. Um, so we are now summarizing and compiling all of that information. We will be presenting out that data to the DCH board on November the 12th. Uh, and during that presentation, we will ask for final approval from the DCH board. Uh, assuming that we will get that, we plan to submit the 1115 waiver to CMS on Friday, November the 13th. Uh, so if all goes well during the board meeting, um, the very next day we are moving that out the door to CMS uh, and we'll begin working with CMS to obtain approval. And the last update that I'll give uh, is just on the CMO merger, and this is the merger between Peach State and WellCare. Just want to remind everyone that that is still scheduled to take place on May the 1st of 2021. Uh, and so we are working on that integration with both health plans right now. There will be an opportunity for WellCare's members. Again, this is limited to WellCare's members to select another CMO. And that opportunity will occur during the month of March of 2021. 
Uh, so we are now preparing the notices and the packets that will go out to the well care members. Those notices will be distributed in February. They will have an opportunity to select a different plan in March. Um, if they opt not to change plans, they will simply roll over and transition onto the Peach State roster. Um, so just want everyone to be aware that that will be taking place uh, early next year. And one more thing I'll mention, we canceled both of our uh, Medicaid fairs this year due to COVID-19. Um, however, we are now planning on doing a virtual Medicaid fair in the early spring of 2021. So we will keep you posted uh, on all of those updates. Uh, and Dr. Holloway and Dr. Sheth, uh, I will pause and conclude there for any questions. Thank Hi, you. Brett. It's Dr. Alexander. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the list of telehealth appropriate uh, diagnoses that uh, we might look uh, forward to uh, related to uh, telehealth? So, you know, I don't know that we have a list of appropriate diagnoses. Um, the the concern, one of the concerns or one of the areas of concerns had to do with, for example, um, physical therapy. And, you know, some of the feedback that we've gotten from members is that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily proven to be beneficial. And so, you know, when I made the comment earlier that, you know, there may be some areas where we say, you know, perhaps it's not appropriate to do telehealth in this area. That's more of what I'm speaking to. Um, but we could, if it would be helpful, Dr. Alexander, at least tell you guys what categories of service we have opened up for telehealth, and maybe that will be responsive to your requests. Is, would that be helpful? Yeah, that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I was just curious. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think therapy is an area of concern, so thanks for raising that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That That's going to be a, um, important for all of us, so to, at least to get started. Um, I, did, I had a question, and that was regarding the um, t the extension of the postpartum to six months. Is that six months just for postpartum or OB gyne care, or is it for full care? So if the mother has hypertension or a sinus infection or anything else, would that also be covered? Yes, it's full care. It will, in essence, be all pregnancy-related type services. Um, so physician's appointments, PCP, uh, and we're also adding into that um, what's called the resource mother component. Uh, and this is something that exists in planning for healthy babies today. And so this will allow a mother to be connected to community resources, uh, you know, to assist with things like the social determinants of health, uh, you know, housing, food, shelter, those types of things. Um, the resource mother component will also help to coordinate uh, appointments, uh, assist with coordinating transportation. Um, so that will be also that will also be an added benefit that will um, be available to the members under the 1115 waiver. Great. Um, I had one other question, if I if I can, and then I know some other people do as well. Um, for, with respect to the well care. Um, uh, merger. Um, so what we know what happens with patients. What about um, providers that only have well care? Can you just give us an update? Is there an active process underway now to yes. have them? Yeah, I'll let you go ahead and speak to that. Yes, that that is an excellent question. <laughs> um, and so that has to do with um, the provider network. And so absolutely. Uh, both Peach State and WellCare have done an analysis of their networks. They've looked at both networks and they've done a comparison to see who's in which network. Um, so they are actually now conducting outreach to all of those providers um, and they are also going to um, transition those contracts over to Peach State. So yes, um, those providers will be contacted, all providers will be contacted 
and be and they will be made aware of their status. But that so work is absolutely underway right now. Great. It's it's not um, so there'll be a transitioning process. It's not necessarily a reapplication process. Right. Which is right. a lot more cumbersome. Yeah, they're not going to make you reapply. Um, absolutely not. It will more so be a transition. You know, there are um, some instances, of course, you know, I'll, I'll give examples, you know, the hospital systems, um, you know, where they do need to go to the table and, and potentially engage in contract negotiations. But for the majority of the providers, um, that will not be required. There will just be a transition. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? So I have a comment. This is Dr. Davis, Clarence. Mm -hmm. And um, that is as relates to the, the whole uh, messaging campaign slash public relate uh, public messages yeah. around um, wellness visits and preventive care visits that are woefully behind. What we have discovered on a deep dive of our members with um, in conjunction, in collaboration with our providers, some of our provider partners, is that the real issue is that most people um, actually think that it's unsafe to visit yeah. the provider. And so the, the focus, if I may humbly suggest, yeah. uh, the focus should be on reassuring people and making them aware of all the many adjustments and um, um, just the resources that all of our providers have thrown at uh, and the thoughtfulness that they have provided and put into making certain that that's a safe visit. Yeah. That would go a long ways. I agree. I agree. Um, and I'm actually going to be meeting with our communications director this afternoon, and I will add this as one of the talking points <laughs> for the commissioner. So, yes. Thank you. I mean, Thank we're, you. This is Dr. Alexander. We're like the airline industry. You know, we've got to show the pictures of uh, <laughs> decontaminating um, inside uh, airplanes. And, yeah. uh, and I think some of that messaging it has to include uh, how physicians are managing their waiting rooms um, so that everybody is as safe as possible. So um. I, I agree. And with respect to that, in addition, not just the waiting rooms, but how we're scheduling patients, the extra cleaning, checking in curbside, check in, um, you know, wait in your car. It's uh, it's there's so many different things that people have put in place and it would be great to have that all a part of that public health emergence or that uh, that public message. Yep. I would tell you, I would tell you I was I was talking to one of our our provider partners, um, AU Center, and they and they said, you know, honestly, it's safer to come visit our providers than it is to go to the grocery store. I'm like, yes. well, you need to get that message out to the, to the members because they don't know that. Yep. Got it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Davis. So that's an excellent point. That'll definitely help. I'll send you a bill. <laughs> <laughs> Lynette, it's, it's Lynette Rhodes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well played, well played, Doc. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this you. is Dr. Alexander. Maybe one other point. We know that related to the COVID pandemic nationwide, there have been 300,000 uh, excess deaths on top of the COVID deaths because pe and people are dying from chronic conditions that have been listed, cardiovascular, Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm not the biggest proponent of negative uh, messaging, but I, I think we, to the extent that we can put, help uh, use that information to help put this in context in terms of not getting visits not getting immunizations uh and you know we've had enough pain and suffering that will continue into the foreseeable future and how can we try to minimize that yeah got it wait one other thing from for me this is this is clarence again um and and that is um i'm assuming and you know how they difficult and delicate that can be but i'm assuming that we're going to leverage um the uh faith-based resources in our state because uh, the, 
the overwhelming majority of this um, disallowance or dis, um, disinterest in, in preventive care is being um, disproportionately skewed towards the communities of color. And so you can't get a better partner than the faith-based community in, in, with respect to that. Okay, got it. Yeah, I would, this is Laura. I'd like to echo um, Dr. Davis's comments. I think that's um, really insightful and smart um, to include. I think as, you know, understanding the Medicaid population, many of them aren't attached to a single primary care provider necessarily. So um, I would also, you know, suggest, you know, making some, some intentional effort to reach out to local community-based organizations that, you know, are really, you know, working with and serving um, Medicaid members in other ways. Okay. Got it. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, um, is there anybody else with any other questions or um, comments for Lynette? If not, um, I think we need to, I think the next um, thing on the agenda is the quality strategy. I do have a couple of questions. Sorry, um, Dr. Jasmine. No, I'll, I'll keep them as short as possible. No, um, go ahead. I just want to make sure we get everybody in this video yeah, format. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, Lynette, first of all, congrats to the department for all of the hard work you all have been doing. Clearly, um, there's no lack of uh, of effort being made by the by the department. So, um, cheers to that. Um, on the 1115, the on the 1115 pathways waiver, not the postpartum um, one, but our, as you all are thinking through kind of the paperwork and documentation that will be required for people to prove that they've met the qualifying activities, um, what's the best way for us to offer some input into that? We you know we want to make sure that that process is as easy as possible for consumers that meet those so that it's not kind of an extra hurdle to jump over. Right. So you can send something to me in writing, Laura, or we can do a quick conference call. Um, I'm flexible mm -hmm. either way. Just I think you have my email. Just let me know what works best for you. Um, okay. We can jump on a quick call. I can loop in Blake and then we can go from there. OK, great. And then is on the 1332. Um, I'm forgetting with like the, there's been a number of drafts of that waiver, so I'm forgetting where which draft this was in. But I believe that that, that waiver was going to be um, kind of uh, implemented by a new office of health uh, innovation. Is that still happening or is that going to sit with DCH now? No, that is still going to happen. Um, so it, it okay. will not rest with us. Um, but right now, I think we're still trying to figure out exactly how that works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so more to come there. Okay, great. Um, and then one last question. This is a, a little off from the other updates you've offered, but we did, and I, I believe there's a public comment period on this question currently. Um, but we've gotten a few phone calls about, um, I guess there's some proposed changes to the uh, now and comp waivers. Yes. Um, and so didn't know if you had information to share on that or where the best uh, place to go to get some information on those changes is. Yeah, so that's a great question. So absolutely. Um, at the no November 12th, I'm losing my at the November 12th board meeting, we did present proposed changes to the now and comp waiver. Um, and those are there are a number of things. So there are two services that we're proposing to eliminate. Um, the community guide service and um, there's one other and then the, the biggest rub I think or concern had to do with us placing a cap or a maximum limit on the number of additional staffing hours a member could have as well as the number of skilled nursing hours a member could have. So we were going to cap that at 16 hours. Um, so that public comment period, Laura, is open right now. And actually, there is literally at this moment a public hearing taking place on WebEx. Um, so I don't know if this will end in time for you to jump off and attend that. I think that runs until 12. That started at 1030, I think. Um, and so but you can submit your comments. It's a 30 day window. We just opened it on November the 12th. Um, and I believe the 
public notice is posted on the DCH website, but I'll just send that to you, Laura, so you'll have it. Thank you, That's that would be very helpful. Okay. All right, then I'm gonna turn off my camera and go on to mute. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much, Lynette, for the update. Um, next item on the um, is the quality strategy, Dr. Holloway. Yes, thank you, Dr. Seth. We're having some technical challenges to be able to share the presentation, but let me just walk through that and we'll ensure that that slide deck gets to each of the uh, the, the members. Um, we wanted to provide kind of an overview of the status of quality strategy uh, that uh, will be essentially in effect going from 2021 through uh, at least 2023. Um, we have um, Those states that are contracting with uh, managed care organizations are required by uh, CMS under the Medicaid managed care rule to have a quality strategy in place and review and update that quality strategy kind of as needed, but certainly uh, no less than every three years. We're certainly operating currently under our quality strategy uh, that is due to be updated uh, at this point in time. So I wanted to provide just kind of a little overview in regards to that, that approach and uh, where where we stand to date in regards to moving to, uh, toward that end. Uh, you know, my team uh, and certainly involving me, uh, Gloria Beecher, Carla Willis, and the, the remainder of the performance and care management team, as well as the other uh, DCH members, uh, we'll we'll be uh, leading leading those efforts. Uh, we certainly will be involved. Uh, it's okay. It's my understanding you are able to see it now, so thank you. Uh, that will be you know led by uh, by our team and the persons that are noted here. Next slide, please. We've also solicited um, support from our who from um, HSAT Health Service Advisory Group to to assist in facilitating that. Uh, certainly, the expectations of CMS or as I stated, that we will update the, the strategy and including in that some of the content is noted here, certainly the background as far as uh, Medicaid and the state, uh, what goals, objectives, and uh, measures uh, and targets will be utilized, uh, what performance improvement projects, and how will we evaluate those tactics and programs that are put in place to address uh, health uh, disparities. Uh, also, other expectations, next slide, uh, will be to take a look at in terms of how do we monitor and evaluate and give feedback to the uh, CMOs within our states in regards to uh, adhering to standards, access, structure, and operations. How do we engage stakeholders inclusive of the Medical Care Advisory Committee and our beneficiaries in this undertaking? And how do we also utilize the services of an independent external quality review organization or an ACRO. Next slide. Uh, our, our approach in this undertaking, uh, at least from a, a, a strategy logic model, take inputs from stakeholders, uh, those that are internal as well as external to the Department of Community Health, uh, using also the resources of our ECRO, and how do we turn that into certainly providing insights to data and analyzing that such that we can then speak to how we will move our state forward as far as health status and outcomes, be it short term, mid term, as well as long term uh, uh, goals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, additional content certainly will give some insight in regards to uh, how we developed the, the, the strategy, how we are revising it, and how we're using uh, quality assessment and performance improvement to stay on top and advance it on an ongoing basis. Uh, next slide. How we use our governance structure, be it in terms of our quality oversight committee, our, our structure within MAP, as well as adhering to the expectations of our regulatory entity as far as CMS and how we make that crosswalk between this endeavor and that regulatory requirements. Next slide, please. That's, under, that's going to be undergirded about a lot of information. A good bulk of that is certainly going to be within the appendix of the document. Certainly things that will be in the um, appendix certainly speak to our, our performance measurements, our goals, 
uh, and tactics toward achieving those, how we attract those goals over a period of time, and also the evaluation as relates to the effectiveness of that strategy. We certainly want to place information there that may change possibly year over year or over time period and may not be locked in by placing in the body of the quality strategy. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, the approach certainly will also to take seek input from stakeholders, as I mentioned, inclusive of this body, uh, providing input as it pertains to thoughts and perspectives around the goals and objectives and metrics, uh, as well as the tactics that are being proposed to, to address and move toward achieving. Next slide. Uh, this illustration just is kind of to point to uh, how we plan on flushing this out and approaching. Right now, we're speaking of kind of five overarching aims uh, that are centering around certainly uh, achieving or improving our health and services and expectation, how we utilize those resources. And we've opted to pull out specific populations, our uh, Georgia Family 360 population, as well as our home community based services or LTSS population. Uh, with specific goals and objectives. Uh, to the right on the uh, visualization, you, you see some kind of some some uh, sample goals that we are speaking to right now. And as we mentioned, those will be undergirded with objective tactics and, and programs to advance those. That's going to be more, and we'll certainly come back to this particular body as well as other stakeholders for opportunities to assist in flushing some of these, uh, uh, these areas out. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So the timetable that we are embarking or engaged in right now is that we started the uh, process and kicked this off in the middle of September, and we certainly are going to uh, flush these out based on the timeframes that you see here. Uh, but we desire to submit the final quality strategy to CMS uh, in the spring of next year. The end of May is our target. As I stated, we certainly are going to engage our stakeholders, inclusive of this body, uh, through the course of the uh, the timeline that's noted here. Next slide. And part of our ask of uh, this particular body uh, is in terms of uh, seeking your input as well as your uh, connections with uh, your associations. Uh, as far as sharing the quality strategy and the oversight, excuse me, the overview that we're providing here, uh, what input might you have or your colleagues as relates to promising practices that might advance the particular goals and aims that are noted here. And as you have that dialogue and, and, and conversation, any feedback would certainly be welcome, ideally prior to our next scheduled meeting in February, uh, so that we can actually share that kind of an aggregate uh, with the full body as far as what came in. And, and also we know that the the templates will be fleshed out much more. We'll have an opportunity to share that with you as well. Uh, we're scheduling some uh, webinars uh, with the certain stakeholders to be identified uh, that will be conducted uh, certainly by our participation as well as our consultant that we've uh, brought on board. Uh, to to assist in not only educating and communicating, but also fleshing out some of the details. Uh, any input that you do have, you certainly can forward it. You see the email that's noted here. Gloria Beecher is our director of population health and quality planning. Uh, certainly forward to her, or if you desire, you can also send that to me. But we greatly appreciate uh, your engagement uh, in this process. We look forward to connecting with you with the webinar and certainly uh, in between, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us if you have questions uh, regarding this endeavor and this undertaking. Um, we'll, we'll pause here. Next slide. We're, we're, we're going to pause here and certainly open the floor up to uh, any questions that that you may, may have uh, regarding uh, the quality strategy and our updating. Thank you, Dr. Holloway. Dr. Holloway. Any Thank questions you. from anyone on the floor? Um, this is Lara Colbert. Um, Dr. Hollowell, thank you for, uh, or Holloway, thank you for uh, presenting this. This is um, great to see. Um, if you all, uh, if the department wants any help in convening um, 
you know, consumer and, and patient groups, um, we, GHF kind of plays that role as part of the patient and consumer advocacy community here in Georgia already. So we'd be happy to help um, if that, you know, if that's useful to you all. If it's not, please don't let us stand in the way. Um, and then um, my other comment is um, just a, a, this may be too early for this input and we'll be happy to repeat it at the whenever the right phase is. But um, in thinking about the performance improvement plan, um, I'd like to offer the, a suggestion that um, that DCH look at possibly um, using one of using the, the funding and the resources that come along with a performance improvement plan to um, do mental health and substance use screenings in education settings and schools for for young people and youth. Now we know that COVID's having obviously a really incredible impact on behavioral health um, across across the lifespan, but um, especially for children who are out of school right now. And I, I think that um, we'll probably see that fallout over the next few years. And so having, you know, um, a, a PIP in place to do screenings in schools for young people, I think could go a lot in addressing those issues early and doing some prevention work as well. No, thank thank you uh, greatly for the feedback, um, Ms. Ms. Colbert. We we that's exactly the type of feedback that we desire, and, and you know we will take you up on connecting with you the pot for the possibility of connecting with the stakeholders on the consumer side, and and please your comments that you're providing as well as any others. If you would just kind of uh, shoot an email reflecting what you just shared, uh, be it to me or even Gloria Beecher, I would greatly appreciate it. Look forward to connecting with you about that. Excellent. Is any other questions or comments for Dr. Holloway? If not, I'm going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is the NEBA presentation that we had um, in August. Um, and um, I can actually give the statement. We um, there were um, a handful of us that did a follow up after the presentation, did further research and um, talked to our neurology colleagues as well as um, um, publications. And our position statement that um, we basically have created after looking at the um, all of our resources and the information that was presented by NEBA is the following, and that's the members of the MCAC have reviewed several resources surrounding NEBA's methods utilizing the theta-beta ratio and its correlation to ADHD. And our conclusion at this time is that it is not sensitive enough to use as a standard in ADHD evaluation. While it's interesting in theory, the data is not conclusive time to recommend to DCH to utilize this technology as a standard for all of our members. So we would encourage NEBA to conduct more studies to support their theory and perhaps present again once they have stronger evidence and it truly becomes an accepted clinical standard to aid in the diagnosis of ADHD. Um, that is what members that have come together have, um, that were interested um, have come to the conclusion of. Is there any comments or questions regarding that? Hearing none, um, uh, the next item is any announcements or information or new business? Dr. Seth, the, the only announcement is just making note of what's on the agenda as it pertains to our, our next meeting uh, that's scheduled for the first quarter of uh, 2021 on uh, February the 17th. Uh, more than likely, it still will be a virtual meeting. Um, that's the only announcement I, I have, um, Dr. Seth. Okay, thank you. Hearing no other announcements, then as Dr. Holloway said, we'll probably see each other virtually again, um, February 17th, 2021 in the new year. Hopefully the new year has 
much better things to hold for us than 2020. But thank you all for your participation today and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.